Well, good morning to the Living Church, and happy Father's Day. I hope you've begun your day with joy, and I hope it continues that way. Well, the year was 1806, and John Coulter had asked permission to leave the Lewis and Clark expedition as they came, made their way back to Washington, D.C. He wanted to stay at the headwaters of the Missouri River and trap beaver and bring those pelts back and make his fortune. And he was given permission to do that. And a couple of years later, he and his partner, John Potts, were uh, paddling their canoes down a stream, and suddenly they were surrounded by a hundred Blackfeet warriors. These warriors mentioned, you need to come ashore. Potts resisted that and was instantly shot through with several arrows and killed in his canoe. John Coulter was motioned, you come to us. He came forward. They dragged him out of his canoe. They stripped him naked, and they were making motions that they were going to kill him and the motions they were making was that that killing would be very, very painful and long. He understood from what they were saying by hand motions that they were asking him, are you a fast runner? And he lied to them and he said, no. They wanted to make a sport of him, so they gave him a head start. They were just going to hunt him down as a game. He took off running across the prairie. He was a fast runner. He outran them all, but he, after three miles, he was totally exhausted he turned around with blood coming from his nose, and there was one warrior still chasing him, and somehow he grabbed that warrior's spear and killed him with his own spear and took his blanket. Well, he, he ran, and he ran to the Jefferson River. He dived in this cold, icy river and, and went underneath a uh, log jam, a driftwood raft, found an air pocket there as the warrior stomped on top of it, trying to find out if he was in there. He stayed in there for several hours in that icy water. He finally dragged himself out of there. He's still naked. He has no weapon. He has one blanket, and he's 250 miles from the nearest trading post. So 11 days later, John Coulter wanders into this trading post, starving and uh, sunburned, I'm sure. What a, what a journey this man took. And the, the amazing thing about John Coulter is after he got his health back, he went back to get his traps and his pelts. Now, there's a man. There's a man. But you know, I haven't had too much opportunity to demonstrate my manhood in that way. Most guys in a white-collar suburb like this don't have ways to demonstrate what a man they are, how courageous and how fast and how inventive and resilient they are. But that's our question today. What is a man? When you utter the word man, men, masculinity, manhood, manliness, you are uttering a cultural blasphemy in our culture. Because men are blamed for almost everything in this culture. And the term masculinity is deemed archaic, it's deemed patriarchal, it's deemed abusive, it's, it's laden with all kinds of hegemonic power that's around it. It is sexist. There's a character, caricature of what men are and what they ought to be. And the radical right says, well, a real man is, is Top Gun. He's James Bond. He's Jason Bourne. And the radical left says, no, a, a real man is this metrosexual pajama boy who lives in his mother's basement crocheting blankets for his dog. And somewhere in between, we want to find out what is a man. So where do we go for a definition or a blueprint? Well, you know where we're going. We're going to Scripture. So just to give you a broad brush of a lot of theology, let me just give you three things that the Bible indisputably describes as a man. Number one, he is created biologically. There is a biological category called a male. And if they could take your DNA before you were born, you would find you had a Y chromosome and you are a man. If they sampled your bones 100 years after you're in the grave to find out was this a man or a woman, they would find that if, if there was a Y chromosome there, you're a man, biologically male. Secondly, a man is destined eternally. God created men and women, of course, but men in the image of himself to be a living soul. 
to live forever. And the, the goal is there to live with God or not, but you will live forever as a man. And God is calling and redeeming the whole plan of God. The whole program of the gospel is to redeem mankind, to redeem all of humanity, but to redeem men and bring men into his kingdom to serve him and love him and to find true life in him. Thirdly, a man is called intentionally, that there are roles, roles and relationships that, that a man is supposed to fulfill. And here we're not talking about who mows the lawn or who drives and who navigates or, or who, uh, who balances the books or who, has, who is the person who takes care of the children. We're not talking about those specific kind of roles. We're talking about the role of a man to be a pro protector and a provider that everyone under a man's leadership in his business, in his home, in his family, recognizes this man is protecting them under an umbrella and they physically, emotionally, and spiritually feel cared for. Not in perfection, but they recognize this man is trying to fulfill his role. So as a church, we want to affirm maleness in boys and we want to affirm masculinity in men. So out of all the examples in the Bible, and many of them are bad examples, out of all the stories, all the teaching, what could we say a man is? Well, I've selected one verse today because I do think it is comprehensive and it's personal for all of us who are men and for every woman who's praying for her man. So if you're able to stand, will you stand with me as I read 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Paul the mentor is writing to his mentee, Timothy, and here's what he says to Timothy. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Now that's a short verse, so I want all of you men to read it with me in your best James Earl Jones baritone manly voice. Let's read it confidently and in a manly way. Would you read it with me? Let's read it. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, the setting of this verse is the city of Ephesus, one of the principal cities of the Middle East at that time. And it was a city that was filled with the occult, a lot of religion there. It was filled with sexuality, and it's a, it's a setting that's all too current for our current culture today. In fact, if you look just earlier in the chapter, chapter 4, verse 1, here's what Paul is saying about the context in which he's writing to a man to help him to have a manliness and a masculinity. He says this in verse 1. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in the later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. What Paul is saying is that once you depart from the truth of the Scripture, once you depart from a biblical worldview, once you sever your relationship with the Creator, then there's anything goes then it's sheer relativism that people will tell you what they want to tell you. Once you're adrift from the truth, then anything can become your truth. And there's a stampede in our culture, especially on our campuses and in academia and in politics, that masculinity is harmful, that we need to get rid of all talk of masculinity. In fact, it's called toxic masculinity. And with this, they broad brush every man around the world and certainly in our own culture. These three things characterize toxic mas masculinity. Suppressed emotions, a hardness and toughness, and that we emulate violence and power. And with this basic broad brush, they say this is the disease that we need to blame for all sexual violence, for all body shaming, for all domestic violence, all wars, all gun violence, all these things. And we know, we're not denying that men are involved in all these things. 
But along with the baby or the bathwater, they're throwing out the baby. They're throwing out maleness and boyhood and masculinity and men. But they're saying that masculinity is the scourge of society. But even if we read the same context in chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, Paul says this in verse 4, for everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. What we want to do today in these few minutes is to call upon that calling of holiness for manhood, to see what God has meant to redeem the fallenness of humanity and what a man ought to be and a calling for men to become that man that God wants. And this is a message for men and women today. So I want to ask you to pray through this message. Don't just pray that it'll be over soon, but pray through the message. I want you to think about a man. I'm going to describe five qualities of true manliness. And I want you to think about a man, and it may well be yourself. If you're a wife here, maybe you're going to be praying for a husband. Maybe it's for a son, a grandson, a brother, somebody you know, a man in your life. I want you to pray for this man because our world, our city, our businesses, our families, our schools, our church needs men who are different. And Paul's going to describe that kind of man. So who's the man that you'll be praying for? This is a very practical message. And, uh, but it's not a checklist to say, okay, I want to size up this guy and find out where his faults are. You're going to find plenty. Or I want to size up myself and, and find out how, how inadequate I am. This is not a checklist to find out our defects so much as it is an invitation to move toward true masculinity in our lives and our expressions of that masculinity. So Paul says in this chapter that train yourself in godliness. So there are five exercises, five goals five markers of what I'm going to say is true masculinity as God speaks verbatim to men today. The first one is this. If you're going to train yourself, you should have trained speech. The very first thing noticeable about you as a man is how you talk. It's the words you use. Men, our words are powerful they speak to the people around us. And we need to recognize we need a trained speech. The master class in this is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, which says, let no corrupting or rotting or putrefying talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. He's talking about the quality of our speech. It comes from a different well. It comes from a, a desire to build someone up, not to exalt myself or get my way. It also talks about the, the quantity of the speech, you know, as fits the occasion. So sometimes we just need to be quiet, shut up, and let somebody else talk. But it's also talking about the motive of the whole thing that it may give grace to those who hear it. This is the master class for all of us men, for all of us b believers, in how to communicate. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 11 says, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. Colossians 4, 6, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt. 1 Peter 3, 9, not returning insult for insult, but giving blessing instead. Mark Twain said the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. A huge difference. We need to train our speech because a word can heal, it can lift, it can strengthen, or it can devastate and diminish and dismember someone. You can encourage with a word, or you can shame with a word. You can beautify something, or you can deface with a few words. So how you speak, men, 
not just the actual vocabulary, but your facial expression, your tone of voice, your body language is the way you communicate to those around you and convey who you are as a man. It's the true mark of a man. But it's impossible to just change your speech. Oh, you can learn a new vocabulary. Maybe you can cut out a few choice words you've used or maybe learn how to make a compliment. But here's what Jesus said about our speech. Matthew 15, verse 18. He says, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. So if what's coming out of my mouth is coming out of my heart, I need to go upstream and recognize that my speech, my trained speech needs to be rooted in godliness. If I'm full of myself, if I'm full of shame, if I'm full of anger or defensiveness or threat or lust, it's going to come out in my speech. And so all of these qualities I'm going to give you today are not just behaviors, they're rooted in something deeper, and this speech needs to be rooted in godliness. So, so what is godliness? Is godliness some kind of uptight perfectionism? Is it, is it speaking in King James English all the time? Is it using blessing in every sentence that you, that you say? No, godliness is to put God at the center. If, you were to, if I were to put myself at the center of my life, what you would receive in my speech is rogerliness. Everything's rogerly. Everything flows from the center of Roger. Everything's focused on Roger. Everything is as shallow as Roger. But if God is at the center of my life, my speech becomes godly speech. It doesn't have a different tone. It doesn't sound strange. I'm still speaking English, but the whole well of my life is centered on godliness. God is in the frame. God is in the center. His word, his spirit, his intentions are part of my life. So a man, a real man who trains his speech is training his speech by the word of God, the spirit of God, daily confession, putting God at the center of his life. Well, that's the first quality that Paul gives to Timothy, that trained speech is rooted in godliness. Now he moves on to the second one, and it's called trained Conduct. The word here means manner of life or behavior. And Timothy had a front row seat to the conduct of Paul's life. He had a 360 degree view of the way Paul lived and conducted his life. In fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul himself writes in the last letter that he wrote, he writes to Timothy these words You, Timothy, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Now, I've done whole weekend men's retreats on those two verses about how Paul displayed to Timothy his proactive ambition. He let Timothy see the motivation of his heart. He invited him into his passion for the gospel. He saw his vivid faith and his love, things that you never would have seen unless Paul had revealed them to Timothy. But Timothy also saw his responsive endurance, how he worked in the hot sun to provide for his own ministry, how he responded to the pressures and the persecutions, how he recuperated from the beatings that he'd gotten. So I think the rest of Timothy's life, he must have had a wristband that said, WWPD, what would Paul do? Because Paul said over and over, imitate me. He didn't say that out of pride. He said, I'm going to show you how God is working in my life, as incomplete as it may be, but I want to give you an example. I want to give you a prototype that you can follow. So this kind of trained conduct is rooted not in just one man's example, it's rooted in conviction. We need, to, we need to take root 
in a deeper conviction, that this is not just behavior modification. It's that I have a deeper well of conviction that the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and the community of faith is, is helping me advance toward transformation. And when I have conviction in my life, it bears fruit in my behavior. So this is how your normal life is just more than just words. What this means is that as men, this is the kind of conviction that shows itself when we're not on the stage, but when we're just in our home. Uh, One man said recently, I want to be famous in my own house. I think that's a good goal. After all, where does the church look for its spiritual leaders? Well, it looks at how a man manages his own household. I want to be famous in my own home. This is a conviction that's not necessarily in the spotlight, but it's also in the shadowlands of disappointment, of frustration, of fatigue and failure. How does a man conduct himself when things don't go the way that he wants, when he hasn't reached his goal, when people have failed him? Well, the Apostle Paul modeled for Timothy, this is a man who lived by the conviction that God was in his life, and that no matter what happened, it really is possible for a man of God to be the man God wants him to be in any and every situation. This is the trained conduct that Paul is calling forth from Timothy And this is the conduct that with its conviction will bring forth courage in our world. And you know, men, we are going to need courage as we move forward in the context in which we live. So trained conduct is rooted in conviction. Like William Wallace said in Braveheart, will you follow? Will you follow? Do you have the conviction to follow no matter what? So there's a third quality here. And you might be writing some of these down because you need them or because you're praying for them, and that's trained love. Train yourself in godliness. Train yourself in love. In 1 Corinthians 13, it says, if we don't have love, we're like a a sounding tornado siren in the wind. Nobody pays attention to us. It's too far away. You know, we're just a big windbag. Nothing really happens without love. In fact, Paul reduces it in Galatians 5, 6, and he says, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. So train yourself to value and pursue the greatest, deepest, most lasting influence. In fact, (coughs) excuse me, the influence that will not only be here on earth, it will follow you right into eternity. And that is the love that you sow in the lives of your people that you love. And this is not a check the box accomplishment, this is a training. We can do this no matter how old we are, no matter how young you are, you can begin training the love in your life that comes out of your life. And this love needs to be rooted in commitment. You see, the word used here for love is the word agape. And agape is the kind of love that chooses to love. Sometimes it doesn't feel like a love, but it chooses to love. It's the kind of love when when a, a sweating groom stands at the altar and he says, forsaking all others, I plight thee my troth. He doesn't understand those old ancient words what it means, I pledge you my loyalty. No matter what happens, I'm committed to you. And there's nothing as as great for a church than to know that their leaders are committed to Jesus Christ and his word. There's nothing greater for the peace and security of a wife than to know that her husband is committed to her alone. The greatest legacy of a child is to know that her father or his father is committed to modeling the love of Jesus Christ in their home. When I was growing up, my dad used a phrase a thousand times. He said, love chooses to understand. Love chooses to understand. He usually said that when I was frustrated with one of my sisters 
So I didn't appreciate it at that point. But love chooses something. It chooses, instead of assigning the worst possible motive to what someone just said, instead of coming back with some snappy retort, instead of winning the argument with a a haymaker, love chooses, first of all, to try to understand, even when it's hard. And this kind of love keeps moving toward the person. It walks back into the heat. It walks back toward the fire when there's been a a kerfuffle, when there's been a, a conflict, when there's been a disappointment. This kind of love stops trying to figure out the other person and starts walking toward the other person because love chooses to understand. Love says, I want you back more than I want to be right. I want our relationship to be whole. I want unity in the fellowship of the body of Christ more than I want my way. This love, this trained love is rooted in a commitment that says, I'm here for you and I choose to love you. Now there's a fourth quality and that's trained faith. Train yourself in faith. And there's two kinds of faith. Well, two two generations of faith. One is an objective faith, and the other is a subjective faith. Paul says, train yourself in the faith. The faith is the objective foundational belief that Jesus Christ, a real man, lived on earth, said, I will take your sin. He died on the cross to pay for my sin. He was buried for three days, and he rose again. That's the gospel. I have absolute objective faith that that happened outside of me. It was for me on my behalf. I believe that. That's what I have faith in. But there's another expression of that faith, and that's an active faith, which says, I need to walk with him today. I want to live a life that's larger than my own ability to control. I want to believe that God is actively working in my life to supply not only the material needs that I have, but also the growth that I need And so I actively trust the author, and I ask him every day, and I pray to him, and I don't depend on my own outcomes. I trust the author to live larger than what I can see. And this kind of faith, this trained faith, is rooted in authority. It's rooted in the authority of the word, that 90% of what God, (coughs) excuse me, what God wants us to know is right here. So I read this, I study it, I imbibe it, I try to metabolize it. It's rooted in the authority of the eyewitness accounts of those who recorded these words. So trained faith is rooted in the solid rock of the authority of God. So then we come to the fifth category here, the fifth milestone or exercise that Paul is talking about, and that is a trained purity. In verse 5, he has a direct application of this. He says in verse five, chapter, chapter 5, verse 1, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers. And then verse 2, Older women as mothers and younger women as sisters in all purity. There's a little bit between the lines here that Paul is writing to a man, a young man an unmarried man. He's writing, you're going to notice that there are females in your world. And you're going to notice that some of them are very attractive to you. You're going to notice that some of them are older and some of them are younger. And I want you to approach all of these persons of the opposite sex with a whole different aspect of purity in your life. And sisters who are beautiful and attractive I want you to treat as sisters in all purity. Paul recognizes how easily a man could be lured or magnetized or distracted by something that was meant to be beautiful and attractive to him. And men can just quickly be distracted. He could be in the batter's box in the World Series, and if the right woman walked by, he'd take strike three right there. But what wounds a man And what often captivates him in the wrong direction is he does not see this beauty in the context in which God intended it. And Paul is saying to Timothy, 
those women in the church who are your age or younger women, you see them as sisters in all purity. Enjoy their gifts and their beauty, but make sure you discipline your mind. You discipline your eyes. You discipline your intentions to see them in all purity. And the women in the culture, they are sisters of our humanity. And what Paul is saying is that you can train this kind of purity and you can do it by having a different kind of vision, that this is rooted in a vision for where God wants you to take, take you. You see, if you have a, a hunger or you have a wound and you, you feed it or you soothe it with a lie, that becomes an addiction. And that addiction will steal your life. And Paul is saying, you can live amongst the opposite sex. You can live with women as a man and you can train your purity. But this won't just happen by fencing in yourself. It won't happen just by having accountability partners. This really happens by having a different kind of vision, a vision of where God wants to take you. And I've talked to many men who struggle with their own sexuality, and they're struggling with pornography or a sexual addiction, and, and there are many things that can be done, but one of the things I, I try to impress on them most of all, is that you will never conquer this unless you have a greater vision of where God wants to take you. What kind of a man do you want to be next week or next month or next year? What kind of a man do you want to be in 10 years? How do you want your grandchildren to see you? What kind of freedom do you want to exercise? What kind of trust do you want to engender? That's a vision. It's bigger than just white-knuckling it through temptation. It's saying, because I want this in my life, because God is empowering me, I can overcome these temptations against purity to pursue what God wants in my life. So, for example, instead of just faking it through workouts, a young athlete catches a vision, I could really contribute to this team, and his whole attitude and his work ethic changes. Instead of just losing 20 pounds because I want to look better. I have a vision. I want to be healthy and vital for my grandchildren. I want to outlive my dad's legacy or my uncle's. I want to break the pattern that's been a, a pattern in our, whole, in our whole family system. This is what God is saying. Catch a vision for where, you want, where he wants to take you, that this trained purity is rooted in a vision, a new vision. Well, our speech needs to be rooted in godliness. Our conduct needs to be rooted in a conviction. Our love needs to be, our, our, our love needs to be rooted in commitment and our faith needs to be rooted in authority. Our purity needs to be rooted in a new vision. This is not a checklist. None of us as men would live up to this. None of us in our own self-assessment would say, well, I'm there. No, these are workouts. This is training. This is come to the gymnasium, no matter how young or how old you are, no matter where you are in the spectrum. Let's not make this a checklist. Let's make it a prayer list. And if you're a woman today praying for a man, maybe today you notice in that man you're praying for, one of these qualities is prominent. One of these things is a part of his life. What a great day to affirm him and say, I know, I know that you're working on this. I know, I can see your progress in this quality. Thank you for being this kind of man. The world needs a different kind of man. Our schools need a different kind of boy. Our teams need a different kind of young athlete. Our colleges need a different kind of scholar. Our homes need a different kind of man who leans into the wind and presses onto his higher calling. So I want to close with some verses that have been on my mind a lot, heavy on my mind for the last three years. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, Proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, lovers of pleasure, treacherous, reckless, 
swollen with conceit, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. This is not a chart or a calendar of the last days. It's a description, however, of the days in which we live. The days that I really believe are last days. And you don't need a a chart to tell you if you just hold your finger into the wind. Jesus said, if you look to the horizon and watch the storm clouds gathering, you will see that the Son of Man is at hand. And I'm not giving you a prediction of timing, but I'm saying we are there. Men, we are there. And Jesus is calling boys who know Jesus to be a different kind of boy in your classroom, in your neighborhood, in your family, boys who will help their mom and boys who will thank their dad. Jesus is calling a different kind of athlete who in the locker room will refuse the crudeness and the despicable kind of behavior that goes on behind those doors and will stand apart from that. Jesus is calling young men who know Jesus in the military to not just go ashore and do what everybody else is doing, not just take their leave and go into that debauchery, but have a separate kind of fellowship and brotherhood that serves as an example for all those, and it's genuinely rewarding to them. Jesus is calling businessmen whose words and eyes and intentions are so clear and so God-centered that the females who work around them know this is a man, a man who can be trusted. And Jesus is calling husbands and fathers to be committed to their wives, to love their children, to serve a higher authority. There's nothing as securing for a home than for a wife and children to know, (coughs) excuse me, the man in our house bows the knee to a higher authority and he's teachable. And maybe, just maybe, when someone asks you, what is a man? Maybe you can just point. There's one. He's training himself in the ways of Jesus himself. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you today that in this flurry of words that I've said, that there may be one or two or a practice that's lodged in the heart of a man that he will diligently pray for and purposely pursue. I pray, Lord, for the women of this congregation who are praying for a man, that, Lord, they will continue to diligently pray, that he would train himself in these ways. And I pray, Lord, that we can see glimpses of that in our lives as we are transformed by the power of the gospel. Lord, I pray for the men of this church that we will rise up when our hour comes and just in normal life, to be the men that you've called us to be, to be like Jesus himself, who is our great example. We pray this in his name and for his glory. In Jesus' name, amen.